Hello, welcome to the Math 135 video for constructing arcsine. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The intensity for this video is mild. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to construct the inverse of transformations of sine of x, and you should be able to compute the domain and range of arcsine, as well as compute some of its special values. Let's start with motivation. What does the inverse function of sine of x look like, and how can we determine its values? So we're going to answer this question by assuming that you only remember the graph of sine of x and a couple of its basic properties. So we're not going to assume anything fancy about uh, the inverse of sine, only stuff about sine. We're going to come up with everything ourselves. Let's start with the definition. Arc sine of x is defined to be the inverse function for sine of x. And you might wonder why we call it arc sine. Well, we use this instead of using sine to the power negative one of x, which a lot of people incorrectly interpret as being one over sine of x, which it isn't. So we use arc sine to denote inverse sine instead of using this to the power minus one business. So now let's get about the business of sketching arc sine. So as I said, we're only going to assume things about sine. So in particular, I hope that you can draw a sine of x. Here's a couple of uh, periods of sine of x. Now, in order to draw arc sine, we need to reflect it. Specifically, we need to reflect it across the line y equals x. Now, I think this is a challenging thing for some people. So rather than go ahead and reflect it and maybe get the bumps wrong, I like to first take a horizontal line that I understand. So let's take the horizontal line y equals 1. Now since we're reflecting the whole graph sine of x, we'll also need to reflect this horizontal line as well. So if we think about where this horizontal line goes, it'll help us remember where sine of x should go and where the reflection of it should go. So where does this line y equals 1 go? Well it gets reflected to go straight up. So it's going to be over here. And now I think it's a little bit easier to see where this uh, sine of x is going when you reflect it. It's going to be traveling up this line. It's going to be something like that. So here's sine of x. It's sort of following along this horizontal line. So the reflection will travel up the, this vertical line. So there we go. There's the picture of sine and arc sine. But now we have an issue, which is that this thing over here is not a function. It badly fails the vertical line test. So in order for it to pass the vertical line test, we're going to need to restrict the domain of the original function sine of x. So to do that, let's first look at over here, where's a part that will pass the vertical line test? So one example of it would be to take this region right here. So if you take this box, everything inside of the box will pass the vertical line test. There are other boxes you could pick, and each of those would correspond to what's called a branch, a different branch of arc sine. But this one is nice because this branch goes through the origin. So if this is our goal, what domain do we need to restrict over here to get this box? Well, it's actually very similar. So this box right here. Now so far we haven't used any numbers, so we're going to move on to that now, but at least I wanted to understand the picture of what's going on before we get into some of the, the numbers. So now let's figure out what, what's actually the domain and range of this, and what's the domain and range of this. So here we've zoomed into those two parts. You notice that they don't quite look the same, right? This one's flat here, whereas this one's flat but going up. All right, now let's focus on sine for a bit. I promised that we would focus completely on sine. So what are some of the values of this that we know? Well, we know where it reaches this top point, we know where it crosses the x-axis, and we know what this bottom point is. We also know how tall it is, right? So we know that sine of x never goes above one. So where does this horizontal line go? Well, this horizontal line will correspond to this vertical line. 
this horizontal line is plus one, so this uh, vertical line will be at one. Similarly, this vertical line right here, this corresponds to pi over two, x equals pi over two. So then this vertical line will go to this horizontal line. So the uppermost part of arc sine is going to be pi over two. So another way of seeing that is we know what this point here is at the end of sine. It's pi over two, plug it in and you get one. So then because arc sine is the inverse, you've swapped the role of x and y. So this should be one pi over two. Similarly, zero, zero here gets reflected, but it doesn't move, it's still zero, zero. And then finally, this point right here is minus pi over two minus one. And when you change the x and y here, you get something that is minus one minus pi over two. So computing the values of arc sine really come down to remembering where they came from in the sine diagram. All right, so this tells us all also the domain of arc sine. The smallest value you can plug into arc sine is minus one, and the largest value you can plug in is one. And this comes from the fact that sine is minus one at its smallest and plus one at its tallest. Now let's answer an exercise. What is arc sine of one half? Now I know many of you can solve this algebraically, but let's look at what this looks like geometrically in the picture. So arc sine of one half means plug in one half into arc sine. So here's one half. If I plug it in, I get this height. So the question is, what is this height? Well, we can think about this vertical line as coming from a horizontal line over here. So now the question becomes, this is height one half. What do I have to plug in to get one half? So what angle gives me a sine of one half? Well, this is one of our special angles. If you use theta equals pi over six, you'll see that um, sine of pi over six is one half. So that tells us that arc sine of one half is pi over six. You exchange the rule of x and y. So we're understanding things about arc sine by understanding basic things from high school about sine. Let's see one more example. What is arc sine of pi over two? So this one's a little bit confusing for people because I think they get confused with sine. But we're asking about arc sine of pi over two. What happens when you plug in pi over two to this function? Well, you can see the issue right away. Pi over two is bigger than one. So if you try to plug it into arc sine, you don't get anything. One way to see this is that this vertical line is the reflection of the horizontal line y equals pi over 2. And sine never reaches pi over 2. So one way you might write this is arc sine of pi over 2 is undefined since we know that sine theta is always less than 1. And it never reaches this line. Let's end with some exercises. Use the picture of sine of x, the picture of arc sine of x, and the inequality sine of x is less than or equal to x for all positive x to show that x is less than or equal to arc sine of x for all positive x. Repeat all the steps here to construct arc cos and then compute arc cos of one half. A test question might be, let f of x be 20, 20 plus sine of two x. Draw the graph of f inverse of x, assuming you chose the branch that goes through the point 20, 20, zero, and find its domain and range. Also, take a moment to reflect. How can we use the simpler and more familiar function sine of x to give us information about the function arc sine of x? Could you recreate all of this in the slides in a test situation? Why or why not? Thank you very much and have a great day.